Hey everyone, we're back and we're live again. This time I would love to welcome the wonderful Denise Love from Two Little Hours. Welcome Denise. Hi, thank you. So great to see you with us. Denise is a very long, long time friend of Design Cuts and myself. We've worked with her for many years and I basically consider you to be like the texture queen Honestly, you you just live and breathe textures. Two Little Hours is just such a treasure trove of amazing texture art. You've got a whole community around it. So I can't think of anyone better to teach us about this. Thank you. It should be fun. I can see a ton of familiar faces in the chat as well. Um, let us know in the chat if you just finished up the session with Lisa Glanz, where she killed it, brought a ton of value. And I feel like it's the perfect segue don't worry, Denise has lots of dogs, by the way. They're going to join us. It's all good. They're going to join us for the hangout. <laughs> um, so, yeah, let us know if you were just on that session. And we're, we're going to jump straight into some more texture goodness right now. So, Denise, please take it away. All right. So I'm going to share my screen, and then we will take a look at making some textures. Awesome. All right. Can you see my screen? We can, we're getting the uh, inception effects, but yeah, here we are, we can see some textures. All right, so I've opened a couple photos just to put our textures on once we um, make them, just to kind of test them out, because I like to test everything I make. Um, and basically, um, I like to start a texture in a couple different ways, and it's not usually with anything that is um, already made. So I'll just start a new file and go file new, and I'll pick a document or make a size that I want to use. So in this case, most of the textures I create are 6,000 by 4,000 by 300 PPI because that accommodates some of the larger camera sizes. Um, and that's a good texture size for most serious artists that are doing things with their photos. So that's kind of where I start um, now on most of my texture creating things. So I've already created one of those documents. And there's a couple of different ways that I like to start off with a texture. And the first one is I will simply add a solid, solid color layer and I'll just pick a color that I randomly like because this is a layer that I can change that color later. Um, so I'll just start off like that. And then most of the textures I create have several layers and most of those layers are either something I paint or something I photograph. Um, so, or something I scan in like a vintage uh, piece of film. So like I collect a lot of tintypes and glass negatives and old films and they usually have people in them. So um, I'll show you a real easy way that I'll clone a person off of uh, a negative uh, so that you, uh, end, you end up with texture. And is this something you've scanned in, Denise, or you've taken a this photo is, of it? This is a, this is a real glass negative, I believe on this one. And I actually have uh, hundreds of real pieces that I've purchased off of eBay or if I go antique shopping or if uh, maybe I have some in my archives from my family. So anywhere that you can get these old tintypes or negatives, um, they're fantastic because if you look around all the edges of this one, I mean, that's yummy, delicious texture from, you know, a <laughs> hundred years ago that you just can't create any other way. It's amazing. It, and, it know, the an, more, Denise, the I have more, to say, since we became friends, like maybe seven years ago, maybe more, I think. Yeah, it's a long time. Um, I see texture everywhere. Everywhere. Uh, it sense, I see textures. Um, but it's so true. Like, I can't walk down the street without seeing like a grungy, rusty and wall thinking, or something. How I'm like, cool oh, would that be? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so I like things like this that I don't have to create or try to create from scratch. And I like them to be old and antique. And I just like the grunge of all the years that you can get from something like this. The only drawback to using an old piece of film or something like that is it, they can be kind of expensive. Uh, so that's an investment of some money that I have in that collection of actual pieces. And I scan those in usually so that I can go in at at least 600 DPI. Um, or 1200 DPI. So if this is a three by three glass negative, that's not really very big or usable for anything that I do. So I scan them in at a very high resolution so that they're giant by the time I get to them. Another thing that I like to do is paint surfaces. So alcohol ink is one of my favorite. This is an alcohol ink 
uh, painting that's been squirt, uh, squirted with alcohol so that you get all these yummy, delicious layers and speckles. Um, so that's another thing that I like to use in the layers of my textures. Another thing that I do is I go out and photograph surfaces. And this is, uh, these are all brand new too, because um, I've got about 3,000 new resources that I've photographed or painted for a new project I'm working on. Um, so I went to an old train yard museum, and this is a dirty piece of glass in an old train. And I think the glass may have had a crack in it, and that's how it uh, allowed all this condensation up into the glass. But this makes the most beautiful layer in a texture. And it's a beautiful texture by itself. So I love to photograph stuff. Another favorite resource of mine is old pots and pans. So if you go into your kitchen, this is the freest, cheapest, most amazing texture that you can probably create. Um, and the older the pan, the better. One of my very favorite uh, tin pans is a cookie sheet that was my grandmother's. So this cookie sheet's probably 80 years old. And it has all this yummy dirt and grunge and texture and things from, I guess, her baking on it for all those years that I can't, just can't create. So now... I've tried to go to the antique store and eBay, things like that, to purchase purchase old pans, but they're kind of hard to come by. So people either keep them, throw them away, and don't think they have any value or whatever. So raid your own kitchen cabinets or raid all your friends and your grandparents and everybody you know. See if you can borrow their cookie sheets because um, this is one of my very favorite texture sources is just to go with a macro lens mount it on a tripod and just photograph every inch of the bottom of a pan that I love. I love that. Just the detail yeah. on the scratches. I swear that's what I'm always drawn yeah. to. Oh, me too. And this looks so beautiful worked into a photograph. So that's mm -hmm. my four favorite sources, something I photograph, something I paint or an old piece of film. That's my very favorite sources. So if we start off with a solid color layer here, on our document. And I always like my textures to be really layered, um, nice depth, lots of details. Um, so I, I hardly ever use one item and stop there, but you certainly yeah. could. I just rarely do that. Um, so I'm going to take one of these pieces of uh, glass that's got the condensation in it. Because if we zoom in, look at all that yummy texture and detail. Um, so I love that. And Ooh, then I just kind of start off put that on soft light and look at there already. We have some yummy depth, light and dark, the shadows. Um, love that. So um, by the way, sorry, just to pause for a second, Denise, I've just set a yes. poll up. So if you click on polls just below this live stream, I've asked who has ever made their own texture. I know we all kind of use textures and maybe we buy some, but who's actually made their own. Um, so let us know in the poll if you have. I'm really intrigued how many people are going to learn from you today and go make their first ever texture or, you know, who's already doing it, but could learn a thing or two. Fun. Okay, cool. Cool. Well, Sorry, please that, take it away. <laughs> yeah. I hope that some of these techniques will come in handy. Um, so usually um, you could stop right there. That's a pretty texture. And the reason why I do a solid color layer underneath that is because now I can go back and make this texture any color I want. Um, and so it's really nice to be able to make those changes on the fly. Maybe I'd rather have it, you know, that pretty brown color instead. So another thing that I'll usually do is layer a piece of film into textures because that's one of my favorite techniques. So I'm just going to pull one over. Um, and this is that glass negative with the lady. And I'm going to go ahead and put that on soft light before I take the lady out just to see how much of that figure actually shows up in my texture. Because um, a lot of times you'll notice by the time you blend it in with a photo, not very many details show up. Um, the other way that I fix a texture, uh, a piece of film, is I will clone the person out first. But with this, you'll notice that we have very little light area around the lady. We have a whole lot of dark area like a vignette. And it, it would take me a whole lot longer to sit here. I'm going to take the clone tool. I'd have to take my brush very small maybe pick a clone spot kind of beside her and then very carefully try to clone this person off in a way that I'm left with an interesting texture. And if I were making this piece of film as a texture by itself, 
then that's how I would do that. I would clone the person off very carefully with a small brush uh, working in small areas so that the finished texture was pretty. But when I'm working these into a photo, hardly any of that person is visible as a person. So now I don't have to clone off nearly as much. I might clone off the face. So I'm going to go a little bit larger. I am working on that negative layer. And now I'm just going to work on the areas that kind of stand out to me as identifiable. And beyond that, I don't feel like I have to clone very much of that texture off anymore. So if we go back and take a look at that, you can see I didn't clone very much at all, just the face and a little bit of the details further down that looked obvious. But other than that, um, it just kind of adds to the lighting and the shadows of the texture. And you can see we get quite a bit of difference turning that off and on. Now, if I didn't have this piece of uh, dirty glass underneath it, then you would see a whole lot more of that person. I, I love the subtle build up though. I've seen you do this kind of yeah. technique before and I think it's super effective. Love it. Um, another <laughs> thing we could just change this one out real quick. If I turn off that dirty glass layer and pick, for instance, one of these alcohol inks that I've painted. Oh, so beautiful. Oh, these are all so pretty. They're like, they're now that I've used them, I'm going to maybe frame them and hang them on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> um, but look at that. I mean, that's an amazing texture right there. You can see the difference that the piece of film makes if we add that in. Um, another thing that I probably would add if I left it like this would be one of my yummy tin pans. I love scratches on everything. So then I might put that on soft light also. And now that's very subtle. So at that point, maybe I can't see enough detail. So I could go ahead and manipulate that layer by going to image adjustments and getting into the levels. And now I can adjust and add some contrast to that scratchy tin layer. This is already stunning. I just, I, I love it. Completely change that up right there. It's the depth that adds, right? So much yep. depth. I just like to build up the layers. So very rarely will I ever use just one single item. I'll use two or three and maybe put a, an old pan in there. And then it's so beautiful. And then if you're curious as to what that would look like, let's just flatten that for a second and put that on our photograph. And generally I'm looking for tones that are very photo friendly. So, you know, I'm not gonna have a neon green texture that I'm trying to put on a photo. I'm gonna have it colors that I feel like might complement my photos. So, ooh, look at that, that's real pretty. So that's kind of dark. So I actually might go to image adjustment levels and lighten that texture for this. And that was a very warm texture. Um, on a fairly cool photograph. So I could also go into image adjustments, hue saturation, and I could pull some of the color out of that texture so that now we just see the texture. I could also kind of manipulate the opacity a little bit. And if I wanted, I could go on and add a mask with a round soft brush, I could then strategically lighten the texture on the subject if I think it's too much. And I do that with a brush that has soft edges at a very low opacity. So it's very gradual and I'm not removing the texture 100%, but just enough that it's enhancing what I was trying to do. So that's one way that I like to start a texture. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete all that and show you the second way I like to start a texture. So how fun was that first way? <laughs> I love that way. Yeah, whenever I've done this in the past, that's the method that I use. So I'm kind of intrigued what the second method's going to be. I know. I don't know if anybody else does this. It's one of those things I've just kind of accidentally tried one day and thought, oh, I love that. You're giving so, away the secrets. I know, right? Um, so this is a photo that I've taken, oops, at my um, one of my shoots at Old Car City. And it's a line of bicycles, obviously. So this is the next way that I like to start a texture. I will take any photograph and you can take any photograph in your photo library and I will go into blur and Gaussian blur. And I'll have that really super high because if you don't have it very high, you can see too many details like that still looks like an actual picture. And I'm not looking for it to be a picture. I'm just looking to get color variations that I'm not really going to be able to get any other way. So if you're around uh, 450 or 500 pixels, that would be good. And then hit OK. 
And at this point, you can manipulate the colors uh, by lightening them or adding different actions or processing them like a photo if you wanted to. Um, we could lighten those in the levels if it's too dark. And then you get different shadows and variations that you're just not going to get any other way. So that's what I love about using a photo to begin with. One thing I don't use, and maybe I'll pick a sample real quick, um, is something with like white spots. Let's see if this one will do it here. Um, because, sorry, I picked the raw photo. Let me pick the JPEG. I don't like the white spots because if you have white spots in it, they, and that one's not so bad, but they kind of stand out strangely if it's like got some great big white areas. Mm -hmm. Um, so I do try to, and really it's just going to take experimentation on your part to see what you like and don't like. Um, so be careful if you've got something with a lot of white in it. This is a great tip as well, using photos, not just to start off textures, but often to find color palettes. Yeah. You just use the eyedropper tool. Great for color palettes. Um, so this is the layer that we're going to use instead of the solid color layer. And I'm just going to go right back into um, this dirty glass folder and pick another piece of glass. And look at all these details. I mean, that had to occur over like dozens of years. That bus has been sitting in that train yard museum for years and years. It was a bus from like the 60s. Is this texture pack released yet, Denise, the dirty glass? It's not a texture pack. It's a photo. Okay, because that's instantly one of the nicest textures I've ever seen, <laughs> just the glass <laughs> on its own. I love the framing of that. Well, the, the thing I'm working on for January is why I went taking new photos, because this piece of glass was, I don't know, four feet wide, and I just went over every inch as I could. So you can even see the condensation here. It's water so condensating. Sharp. Yeah. Yeah, and it was a really dark, dirty bus to our train. It was a train. And so I was actually had my 90 millimeter macro on my camera. I was set at F8 and I was set at kind of a medium um, ISO. So it wasn't too grainy, which with textures, it doesn't matter if it's grainy, but I, sometimes I don't want all those extra speckles in there from the grain. And then I was propping the camera on my arm and my arm was across my body, kind of holding on to the seat with my camera propped here as I was taking the photos because this is not a situation where I could have had my tripod set up and moving down the whole window taking like every inch of this window so you just got to get creative <laughs> with um, some of these so let's go back to the uh, pots and pans and tack in one of the, look how beautiful that is and soft light and instantly look how pretty that made it. And you can lighten it and add some contrast. And just to give you an example, let's put a solid color underneath it just to see the difference there. Um, do you see how we lost when we just have the solid color, we lost some of those lights and darks that that piece of film gave us. Like you can see now lights and darks in here that we didn't get with the solid color layer. Yep. So it's another layer that you're in there and building up. So if we just flatten that for a moment, let me pull that in on a photo. Let's just pull it in on this one and try soft light just to try it out. Look how pretty that is. And then I might lighten the texture just a little so we can really see the detail of the texture. And then it, another- It looks like a fog or something. Uh, or dirty glass or something that you're looking yeah, through. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. So another little trick that I like to do, if I don't want to use a brush to mask off, um, sometimes I like to use the gradient tool. And this is a, a white to black gradient. It's not um, got any color in it or anything. And I click the mask and then I just pull that gradient out from the subject. And then it gets very subtle around the subject, but a lot more detail around the edges. So that's the second way that I love to mask a texture on my subject when I'm not doing something where the detail is as important. Um, like say you're doing a person, if I'm doing a plant, I can do a little different than if I were doing a person, a person I'd take a brush and be very careful about where I took the texture off of. Love it. Super quick. Super quick and easy. So how fun was that technique? Amazing. <laughs> I love it. <laughs>
And then obviously the third way to start a texture, because there's really three ways I like to start a texture, is to start uh, start it with a actual photo layer and then layer on top of that. And see that texture right there is really beautiful. And just adding that extra layer in there made it even better. Incredible. With and that, I, what I've loved always over the years watching you work, Denise, is it's kind of just trial and error play. Yes. And I can't think of any type of creativity or design where it's so free and it really is just that experimentation. Well, yeah. And, and every time I layer those layers in, I'm like, oh, I love that. And then I know I have something good because I get so excited about it. So <laughs> <laughs> um, that's all it is, is different. You know, you just go out and you take thousands of photos of different textures or you get creative and you paint some things and you take those photos or you pull all your pots and pans out of the cabinet and you take photos of every inch of those pots and pans look how beautiful that is and that is just a regular um casserole pan like what you'd cook you know casserole in or whatever that's just the bottom of the pan and all those scrapes are just from you know putting it in and out of your oven every time you cook something how cool is that it's amazing i it's think amazing. that's it you don't need to go to the surface of mars to get the perfect texture you exactly. have stuff right at home you can paint something pretty like I, I love the alcohol inks. These are pretty. This is the back side of an ink photo. That's just as pretty as the front side. If memory serves, Denise, you also use like the uh, the squirter gun type thing, right? To to do some of your textures. Did the I imagine that? Gun. What is yeah, that? Yeah, like you know the thing that you use to like spray your windows. Oh yeah, I use well, I on the alcohol inks. What those. Is, yeah, what do you call them? Spray bottle. Yeah, yeah, spray bottle. That's a square to gun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, these use a spray bottle. So this uh, spray bottle, I I painted the ink on the UPO paper because the um, alcohol ink works a little differently than other paints. So you use them on UPO paper, and I have a fun little bitty air compressor, and I run the inks around the paper to get all of these yummy details um, where they overlap. So you get darker areas and lighter areas. And then as that's drying, I squirt alcohol on them. Or if I'm using, say, distress stain uh, paints, uh, you squirt water on those to create these yummy water droplets and stuff. So I use all kinds of tools. I've got a whole, this whole other half of the room that we're not looking at is an art studio where there's bins and bins and bins of pretty paints and stuff. <laughs> I would love to see that. And um, people are mentioning one of your packs actually right now is 50% off as part of our birthday. This is a yes. collaborative pack we did before. And I believe that's the pack that actually includes live workshops in your house. Yes. It goes super yeah. in-depth. And we can see really, really behind the scenes where you're setting up some of the photography and all kinds of elements. And those, those videos have been done a little while. So I th my setups have probably changed quite a bit since then. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I can turn the camera around. You want me to turn the camera around so you can kind of see it now? Yeah, sure. Let's do it. Hopefully nothing unplugs. <laughs> okay, hang on. Let me, let me okay. Let's have a look. Um, I, I'm I can actually sure. I'm, I'm going to put a link to this in the chat. Oh, no, okay. the team is so on top of it. The team have done this already. This, uh, Denise, your pack is currently the most popular pack at Design Cuts. I, I can't that? see what it's you top. can see. I cannot believe that. I, but Wow, I, I can see a ton of art materials it's that, it's not amazing. as neat as i as i might normally have it if i were going to show it <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> and then that, you can see that's so cool. I'm, I'm just going to focus on it wow look at this we've got a whole setup here and this is the see, house of the creative um, yeah you can see I've, I've got a setup on my desk i don't know if i'm pointing the right way but i've, I've got that fun little u-shaped tripod thing where i can film things straight down or i can photograph things straight down without having a, a big tripod with a um a boom arm a boom arm on it so that's super handy that little u-shaped metal thing and then i've got a camera on the tripod there because i have other stuff i'm going to film today since i actually fixed my hair and put makeup on <laughs> 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 and then I used to have box lights in here because, you know, this is a spare bedroom of mine and the box lights take up so much space that I actually like these ring lights even better. Can you see the ring lights in here? We can. Very professional. Um, so those actually take up no space at all and they kind of fit on each side of my table or they fit out in the room um, wherever I'm sitting and they're easy to move around. So that's a fun 
different way if you don't want to just have box lights um, sitting out there because um, they're just so big and take up so much space. That's awesome. Um, so I've just so gone back to your screen. Um, so yeah, that, that that was the main texture. Are you um, are you ready to jump into some Q and A, or was there anything else that you wanted to demo? I was going to demo very quickly how I create a brush from old documents. And oh, that's I don't amazing. know if anybody else does this way that I do at all either, because it's another one of those things I just kind of randomly discovered. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're using the newer versions of Photoshop, um, you know, the brush, the biggest brush you can make is like 5,000 pixels. And if you're in an older version of Photoshop, you can make them 2,500 pixels big. Or if you're in Photoshop Elements, it may still be 2,500 pixels. Um, but I'm going to start a new document about the size of the biggest brush I can create, which is 5,000 by 5,000. So I'm just going to create that. And then I've got lots of old documents that I have scanned in. Um, these are real documents that I have purchased from Etsy mostly. Um, and they're not cheap. People are kind of proud of these papers. And they're mostly in French. And I'm sure what they are is real estate papers because they've got lots of different stamps on them. So even though they're real estate papers going into my photography, you can't actually read most of these. And they're kind of meant just to imply some very interesting, pretty writing. Um, so it's not really meant to be read anyway. So when I'm done, you probably can't read it. So I'm just going to pull a document onto my page here and I'm going to rotate it. And then very rarely do I stretch out documents because if it's writing, it may be obvious. So you can stretch it out if you want, just depending on what it is. And I'm just going to set that down and then I'm not going to try to delete the background and do all that hard stuff that is just about impossible to do because this has so many different colors in it. And let me just show you, if you try to do this with the background eraser, which is in here somewhere, here we go. And you're like, oh, I'm going to pick this right here. Um, you get some of the writing disappears. Some of that background paper goes away, but not much. And it stays in all of the letters. And then you're trying to delete it in the letter and not delete your word itself. And oops, I deleted my word. And it just becomes very hard to clean that document up to make it into a brush. Not to mention, um, everywhere that you stopped, you now have all these rings where they overlap each other. And they may be deleting different tones in the paper. So they're very obvious that they've overlapped in little circles. So that's not how I do that, even though that's how most people uh, kind of think that you delete the background on something like this to make a brush. So let's just start over. Yeah, show us the right way then. I'm intrigued. <laughs> so I actually like my brushes to be very organic and kind of have a soft edge so that it doesn't have a flat edge that then is very obvious. So I start off with the lasso tool. And I'm just going to make a selection that's, I don't know, somewhat kidney, kidney bean shaped there. And then I don't want to delete what's in the middle. So I'm going to inverse that selection and hit my delete key. So now you can see, I'm going to go ahead and deselect. Now you can see we have something kind of kidney shaped. Um, if it's got a, a, a hard edge on it, then, you know, you can, you know, go back and do it again just by uh, going backwards and maybe we'll select that again. I don't want a hard edge anywhere. So maybe I won't get as far to the side. And then up here at the top, you'll notice in the feather box, I'm at 150 pixels. So you don't want that to say zero because that'll give you a very sharp edge. Um, and 150 seems to be a one that gives me a nice feathered edge. So that's where I'm sitting on that. So let's inverse that and delete it again. Now I've gotten rid of all my hard edges and I'm going to deselect. And now this is going to be what my brush is, but I don't want this dark paper showing up in there. So now here is the magic. I'm going to go into the levels and before I do that, let's back up. I'm going to go to into image adjustments and black and white. I'm just going to make sure that that's a black and white document um, because when you scan it in, it's actually a, an ivory colored document. I just want it black and white. Then I'm going to go into image adjustments and levels and I'm going to lighten this to the point that the paper disappears. 
and then you can darken it if you're wanting to pull that dark text in really nicely. And at this point, if you've got any area that you don't love or you've got, say, like this little bit of text at the top, um, then you might go ahead and take the eraser tool and just skim around anything that you don't want to be on your brush to clean it up and to make sure all your little edges are nice and soft there. And now I'm ready to make a brush. So you go to edit, define brush preset, give it a name if you want it to. And now look, our pretty brush is done. So hmm. if we go into our that. photo, yeah. And maybe we'll pick a color that we want to stamp over here to the side. And usually I'm using the brushes at a very low opacity because I'm taking off texture. So let's put that opacity at 100 because I'm adding a brush. Add a new layer and then let's stamp that right on there. So I picked blue. Look at that. that doesn't look really good. Let's go back to more of a white real quick. But notice how the first thing that Denise did was actually sample colors from a photo and that definitely can work well a lot of the time oh that's so yeah, cool well, most, just of the frame time, most of the time i do take picture uh samples from the photo but that one i don't know it stayed a blue so i must have canceled out of it i don't know hmm. anyway then i go ahead and adjust the opacity and then at this point you can actually control t and you can freeform transform that a little if you need it to go a little different direction or i can add a mask to that layer and pick a round soft brush and I can come through here and mask off if that's not exactly where I was wanting to sit it I can mask that off a little bit over here so that is how I make brushes from an old piece of paper how cool that's is that amazing. that's so cool I'll tell you what I just want to go and do this now <laughs> Let us know in the comments if after today's sessions you plan on going and making some brushes and making some textures and playing around because that's how I want to spend my evening. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I don't know that that would work for something where you need super sharp, you know, crispy details or anything like that. But because we're using antique documents and like I have a lot of old dictionaries and maybe some dictionary graphics and things like that, um, because these are vintage sources, if there's any type of little artifacts left in the brush, I consider that to be um, a plus or a bonus. I don't consider that to be a flaw. Yeah. Exactly, as it should be. Yeah. Amazing. Well, Denise, are you up for some Q&A? We've probably got another 10, 15 minutes or so. Definitely. Should be perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, if you're able to stop sharing your screen, that will pop back up with the two of us. And we're going to answer as many questions as we can. So, guys, everyone tuned in live, if you check out the Ask a Question feature, and pop any questions that you have for Denise. We're going to try and get through as many as we can. And also use the vote functionality to vote up any questions that are already in there that you'd love to see Denise address. But just for now, let's give it up in the comments for Denise because that was amazing. <laughs> Honestly, I, I, I love some good ideas. Uh, yeah, so much. Like I, um, I'm feeling really inspired. The comments have been full of so much positivity, and I just love the way you teach. So thank you so thank much you. for sharing all that. Thank you. I can't even believe that it took 30 minutes. I thought it was going to take five. <laughs> oh, so I'm, I'm here chatting away with you. <laughs> you can blame me. <laughs> no, no, that was great. Just really, really in depth as well. So awesome. Um, okay. The most popular question by far is from Tanya. And Tanya asks, what camera slash lens combination do you suggest for your photography so, work? If you are for your photography work or making textures? Uh, well, I guess like for photographing some of, actually, yeah, let's, let's leave it open-ended, I guess for the photography work. So if you're doing photography, any camera is fine. Um, I don't like a kit lens, uh, because they don't allow for any nice depth of field. And, you know, one of the main things that I love in doing my photography is the blur that I can get because, uh, you want a sharp subject and a lot of blur to be able to add textures and it really enhance the photo rather than compete with the photo. So, I like a, a lens, uh, like a 50 millimeter prime 1.8 lens is pretty inexpensive. And that's the lens that I used for years and years and years um, until I finally learned how to use my camera and use my lens. And then I'm like, okay, I'm bored. What else can I do? And then I started adding 
other lenses like a standard micro lens, which is a 90 millimeter lens. Um, and I started out with a consumer grade camera, a Canon Rebel that you can get uh, pretty cheap. And then I upgraded to the 7D, which is kind of a semi-pro camera, um, which is the only reason why you would upgrade your camera is when you figure out how your current camera limits your ability. And once you're feeling that you're being limited because you know that it can't do what you're actually trying to accomplish, then it's time to upgrade. So I upgraded to the 7D, which is a uh, crop frame camera. And I used that to build my whole business <laughs> and used it for years and years until like uh, last Christmas when I finally treated myself to a used full frame camera um, because there's um, KEH camera here in the States that gives um, the best used equipment that you can find. And it's about half price. So I finally upgraded to a full frame uh, 5D Mark III, because if you'll go one model back from whatever's current, that'll save you a couple thousand dollars too. And when I'm out shooting textures now, because I want the biggest photo possible to create with, I shoot with that 5D Mark III and the 90 millimeter Tamron macro lens um, because I'm usually hand holding or I've got my hand here and I prop the camera here and I'm using my arm as my tripod. Um, so that lens has vibration reduction in it so that you're most likely to get a really good photo in conditions that are not ideal, like shooting in a train like I was doing. <laughs> so not, shooting, not, not tripods by the sound of it. <laughs> I do like tripods, but when you're in a little time, you know, a, an old train car from the 50s, it has um, very narrow aisles and then yeah. there's seats and then there's nowhere to put the tripod and it's kind of dirty and a little moldy. And then you just got to be careful because there's other people in the museum at the same time you are. So you can't block off a whole little aisle for, you know, as long as you yeah. want to stand and there. Then, so. What is that woman doing taking all yeah. these photos? Yeah, so no, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You get a lot of weird looks when people are like, what are you doing? And you're like, well, I can't even explain it or even tell you what I do. And you really understand. So <laughs> <laughs> just move along. <laughs> Let me get to it. So. Amazing. Thank you. So um, the next question is from Arturo and he asks, what should I look for when combining textures to create a new one? How do I avoid just smashing pictures together to get something cool? That's a really good question. Some of that is your own artistic vision. And I'm sure that I smashed plenty of things together that looked like crap in the early <laughs> years because... Yeah. You know, it's an art. I mean, I'm creating little pieces of art for you to use in your art. And the only way to get good at it is to make a bunch of them. So I'm sure at this point I've made more than 10,000 textures. I just buy the thousands and you don't ever see uh, probably half of them because I'm sitting here just combining layers. And then finally I'm like, oh, I love this one. So then I'll save it. And then I'm combining lots of layers for the next one until I get something that I love. And then I'll save it. It's just going to take practice developing your eye as an artist for what you're trying to create. And then, you know, testing those out in a photo and see if you're getting something that's too grungy or not grungy enough, or if it's, you know, got scratches or it doesn't have scratches. It's just going to come down to your own artistic vision uh, after you've done quite a bit of practice. <laughs> Love that. Um, Sarah asks, what editing did you do to the glass photos after you took them? Or what so is, is what you're showing us the photo? Or, or that is the up? unedited photo. I haven't done anything at all except move them from my camera to my computer because when I'm using them as layers in a texture, if they're dark, I can lighten them up. And then, you know, if I do a lot of work to that piece of glass before I start using it, I might have done the wrong thing. So it's an unedited photo that I was showing you and the things that I scanned were unedited. So those were all raw photos and uh, scans. Incredible. Um, and Barbara asks, is copyright ever an issue with old documents and books? What year is safe? You're usually good to be, I believe it's like over 75 years old or whatever. So when you're buying documents from the 1830s, it, it's not a copyright issue at all. If you're using um, things out of old dictionaries, then, you know, I have, I don't know if you can see behind me, but if I move this a little bit, this right here is a very, very old dictionary from oh, like wow. the late, late 1800s, maybe early 1900s. Um, so anything that you're pulling that's, you know, way from the early of the last century is no problem at all. 
Yeah, um, and then there's a lot of things. There's a lot of documents out in the public domain because they're so old, they're available for use to everything. But I would be really careful using things that are already online or scanned in because you don't know what quality it is, um, especially coming from it, it, it just needs to be a large enough document to be usable and good quality, preferably. So most of the stuff that I make, I've purchased the actual asset. I've actually purchased the paper. I have the paper here in my office and I can scan it in 12 times if I need to change something or make something different later, or maybe I didn't scan it in big enough three years ago and I need it bigger now. Um, I actually have most of those assets. And that's not saying that I haven't used stock assets in the past, but if you're using that stock asset, then everybody else is too. So it's not very original. And so at this point, I don't even do that. I either yeah, love, have love it that. or take that photo or paint that, um, alcohol ink thing or whatever, or use watercolor. I, I try to make them as original as I can now and start off with things that I can scan in or I can paint or I can photograph. Perfect. And obviously everyone uh, watching live, do your due diligence uh, based on where you're sourcing these materials. Definitely. We've had people we work with that actually hire lawyers to go and just double check some of these things. But I if mean, you're starting off with your own original things though, you don't have to worry about that, which is what I love. Yeah, exactly. And and so I think a great starting point is the kitchen pan or whatever it might be. Yeah, um, but look it, how amazing definitely... those are. Go raid everybody's kitchen and I'm going to be jealous if you get stuff that's better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, like they're, they're stunning. And something that we've seen with yourself, people like Tom Chalky, who made the massive vintage collection is you collect these authentic resources and we know people that have spent thousands and thousands of dollars oh, yeah. and they oh, got, yeah, got rooms thousands. full of this stuff, right? In I've got app. thousands of dollars on those film negatives. Cause that for the longest time was my very most favorite, which it probably still is behind the scratchy pans. And mm -hmm. some of those are $20 the negative. They're not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> They're not, but it's, I, I love the authenticity behind it because so many yes. people, like you say, use the same stock photo as everyone else. Yeah, if you've got love... one film from a stock site, everybody's using that. Nobody has any yeah. of my hundred little films. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, are all these techniques transferable for affinity photo? I don't know how familiar you are with that, Denise. Any, any program that uses layers, you should be able to layer a texture just like I did. Yeah, I I think almost definitely Kathy asked that question. Um, I don't yeah, see like, why if it makes if you can make a brush in Affinity Photo, you couldn't do it the exact same way I just did. I just turned it black and white, and then I adjusted the levels, and then I created the brush. But I, I'm not familiar with Affinity, so I don't know if they make brushes. But there's no reason why any program yeah. for layers wouldn't work the exact same. Yeah, I mean it's pretty basic functionality. What you're doing, it's just how you apply yeah. it. It's so creative. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so Carol asks, when adding a texture layer over a photo, do you look for a colored texture layer in the same kind of tones as the photograph? So yeah, when I recommend if you're using textures, a lot of time I'm looking for things that are in the same tones. Um, but if there's a texture I like that's in a different tone that doesn't work, I just desaturate that color out. So it doesn't really matter. Um, but there's no secret sauce to using textures beyond just having to try out a bunch until you find the one that you like. There's nothing that can speed that process up. And a lot of time those color tones distract. So most of the time when I'm creating textures, I try to create them in tones that would complement photos. Um, and then 80% of that time I'm desaturating that tone out anyway. But you know, when people buy textures or they're looking for textures, those colors are pretty and it's a really nice marketing thing. If it's so pretty, they can't resist buying it, whether they leave the color in it or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I know I, I've used a ton of your textures in my own work over the years and I love using it both ways. So I definitely desaturated them just because I wanted some nice details and scratches and I can really bring them out. And sometimes the texture is very subtle, but what it does with the color palette is it completely changes it and it makes yes. it more dynamic and rich. So you, yes. can, you can use it in both ways, right? Yes. Um, people, Some people are asking about a replay. Yes, there definitely will be a replay if you want to go back and watch it again or if you joined late. Um, and God, we've got tons of questions coming in now. Uh, Charlene says, Denise, um, could you select the whole document piece uh, and then use the background eraser tool to eliminate rings and tone changes, if that makes sense? Maybe not. That, that um, makes sense. 
I, I I would go with the method that Denise showed with the um, with the levels and isolating things that way. Perfect. Um, we've got some people as well asking how big are your textures in terms of file size, just because they're so they're so gigantic and so rich. Are they really heavy? So when you do your file save as, you know, you can you can save them at different qualities. And there's it's been proven like when you save anywhere in that high 10 to 12 quality range that the difference in the file size is significant, but the difference in the quality of what you visually see is very uh, minor. So you can save it at 12 and then those file sizes are going to be like 20 megabytes or you can save it at 10 and then they're like five megabytes. And so generally most things that I save, I do save them at the 10 quality. Um, so your file size is still going to be a couple hundred megabytes large, but it's not going to be a gigabyte large. It just depends. It's kind of your preference there and how you're using them. Um, but for textures for sale, I make sure I save them at a 10 quality. So they're still very high resolution, but the file size is not so gigantic that people can't uh, save them on their computer without running out of space. Mm -hmm. um, I know the answer to this next question, but Alan, are, <laughs> are those cyanotypes uh, behind you? It looks like you worked your magic on them. Those are real cyanotypes. They are actually the original ones because I have a cyanotype class on my site and those are the actual original cyanotype prints. They're not manipulated in any way. I go ahead and put the chemical on. I put the ferns on because I like ferns. I squirt them down with some water and some baking powder and some other chemicals because the cyanotype chemical reacts really nicely to different things that you squirt on it and then they are exposed out in the sun and then washed in your sink. And then I uh, just framed them. So those are original cyanotypes. They look beautiful. And we've got some, um, some geodes as well behind, it looks like. Those are resin geodes. So they're geode inspired um, and they're made from resin art. It's just resin art that you pour, you put different pigments in it and you make those like your art table but wow. they are inspired from real geodes. I'm, I'm going to ask people to leave like a little hands up emoji or something like that in the chat. If you want some of the cool stuff in Denise's house, <laughs> <laughs> like if you'd love some of this incredible, like texture paraphernalia around your house, let us know in the comments. Cause well, it's I funny because you know, I make textures and then everything I tend to hang in my house or take a picture of or art that I create tends to look like a texture. So apparently I'm yeah. just all about texture in everything I do. <laughs> That's a good way to be. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of people being like, yes, me. Um, <laughs> perfect. Denise, thank you so, so much. I'm going to ask everyone live um, if you've got your phone handy and you're on Instagram, feel free, like take a little video or photo of us. And if you want to tag up in your stories that you've joined this session, give a shout out. I would tag up at Two Little Owls Studio. I, phone off. I can't take a picture of us. Oh, no. <laughs> I didn't want to do right, in the middle of this. I I'll, I'll take one for us. Hold on, let me uh, let me get this. So yeah, guys, if you want to join us, take a little photo. And uh, yeah, it's two little hours. I'm going to put that in the chat right now. It's two little hours studio on Instagram, and you can tag us up. Um, we're also at Design Cuts on Instagram, of course. And if you want to tag me, I'm Tom Ross Media, and we will reshare the fact that you've joined us on this incredible session. But Denise, thank you. That was so much fun. That was awesome. I so enjoyed being here with you guys. Thank you. It's always fun. We'd love to have you back next year, of course, um, where we're going to go even bigger and better with Design Cuts Live. But yeah, that was so Every unique. year gets bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> of course, same for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've oh, loved watching you. your journey growing to little hours and everyone should go check it out. Denise has all kinds of fantastic courses and membership site over there. It's just a ton of value. Um, and we have, of course, linked up also the two little hours store at design cuts and if you go there now i believe it is ordered by most popular so you can see all of denise's currently most popular packs including the collaborative packs she's done with our team which are just so amazing um as i say i think it's That's our most one of my popular very, pack. very favorite collections i've ever made sometimes i'm like Stunning. why did i give that to you i want it on my own site <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible it's one of my though. favorite yeah, it's just got hundreds of textures in there. So um, yeah, for all the texture geeks here, definitely go check that out. Um, but let's give it up.
for Denise. Thank you guys in the comments for being here today as well. You've been really, really active. It seems like everyone's learned a lot. And it seems like people are going to be getting their hands dirty making some textures tonight, which is fantastic. Bye. I think we're going to see a lot of Denise That's inspired textures out there. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you everyone <laughs> who's joined this session. Our team should be popping it into the chat now, but we've got another session. It's really jam packed today, starting in about five minutes time. And that's with Chris from Pretty Little Lions. We're gonna be jumping back into Procreate and learning some amazing illustration techniques. So if we link that up in the chat, guys, um, if you click on through, we'll literally join you in just a few minutes and we can continue the free fun learning today. But Denise, thank you again. Um, and we you hope- You guys have fun, thank you very thank much. You. It, it's been a blast. I hope you get to enjoy some of the uh, other sessions as well, Denise. Of course, thank you. I love it, I'll talk to you soon and we'll see everyone on the next session. Bye.